Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tyler Sonicson. I'm a longtime, former longtime DC resident. I lived in DC from 2005 until 2011. And uh, it still has a very a massive place in my heart for a whole bunch of reasons. One of the reasons that I moved to DC was because I was kind of, I was inspired by this mythology that had kind of permeated DC as a music scene for me. When I was in college, I was listening to a whole bunch of bands that were from DC very actively. Like when I was in high school, that was when I got into Minor Threat. And then when I, uh, when I was in college, I was introduced to bands like the Dismemberment Plan who played a huge part. They, they reunited in two, they broke up in 2003, but then they reunited in 2007 and then again in 2011. And that those were like both pivotal moments in my DC life. So the Dismemberment Plan were a really big deal to me, as well as Jawbox, who are currently on tour with Jawbreaker, the Monsters of Jaw, and, um, both like big, very important 90s bands that reunited because, you know, because money, but also because um, there are so many fans that are even my age, I'm, I'm in my late 30s, but even people in their you know, teens, 20s and, and 30s now never had a chance to see those bands during their initial 1990s run, and many of them have kids who are college age now so they they're at a point in their lives where they're able to get the band back together and go on these um go on these pretty big tours playing to crowds that are like 10 times bigger than any any crowds they played during their original heyday so uh so what uh emily invited me to to do this talk it was partially inspired by a walking tour that i led in adams morgan and mount pleasant in 2019 the last time that aag met in person which is crazy to say because that was three years ago. And um, and so a little bit of preamble to that. So just by a show of hands, when I say the name Ian Mackay, who has any idea who the hell I'm talking about? You can be honest and just raise your hands for me. Okay, so I see Craig, Sean, Emily, because you were the chair of the communications geography and Puni uh, communications geography specialty group, Emily, uh, when we got in to do a talk on uh, to do a talk, a Q&A &A at AAG 2019. So um, that was, you know, I, I, I kind of pitched that idea. I ran this idea by by Emily. We, yeah, I think this was probably the year before the 2019 meeting because you were the chair of communications geography specialty group and every year within AAG, and I don't know how many people here are, are members of AAG, but like specialty groups have a keynote speaker. And I thought we're going to DC. I published, I put out, I was on my way to publishing a book based off my dissertation, which talked about DC, the DC hardcore scene and its influence on the Paris hardcore scene. Um, it's a book called Capitals of Punk, and it came out shortly after the 2019 meeting. So I thought it would be a really good. Um, oh yeah, you live in you, you live in Adams Morgan, Sean. That's 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 pretty cool. And uh, yeah, I'm glad I've got Puni feeling nostalgic. Well, uh, good news. You know, many of these artists, many of the artists in those bands are actually still pretty active, and I'm going to talk about that shortly. But um, yes, and I did say to, to Panit's question, I did say Jawbox and Jawbreaker. Uh, Jawbreaker were a San Francisco based band in the 90s. They were from LA. Well, two of them were from LA. They started in New York, but they became San Francisco. Uh, but they are touring currently, at least this spring, they're going to be playing shows with Jawbox, who are from DC. And uh, Jay Robbins from Jawbox actually still owns and runs a very active and very uh, successful recording studio in Baltimore. So, and he actually put, he's been still releasing music and, um, you know, he's, he's been, he's been killing it even well into, and I don't want to, I don't want to be ageist, but like well into middle age, he's still putting out, um, you know, he's put, he's still putting out like music pretty prolifically, but he's also producing a lot of really great bands. But um, so anyway, we did a, we did a Q and A, uh, at AAG with Ian Mackay, who uh, who founded a label in 1980 called Discord, which is spelled D-I-S-C-H-O-R-D, which is a really good, which is, you know, just a classic pun. But Discord Records was started by a group of, of kids from Northwest DC who were playing this style of hardcore, which was not completely distinct or unique to DC, but it was very heavily influenced by DC. Bands like Bad Brains, bands like, um, uh, bands like Bad Brains and earlier like new wave bands like the Slicky Boys kind of influenced a lot of DC 
uh, teenagers to pick up guitars and, and they were, it was the late 70s, so they were influenced by bands like the Sex Pistols or the Ramones. And they decided because they were just a bunch of kids from Northwest DC and at the time the, the capital, Washington had, it had a music scene, but it was very kind of paltry. There was no interest from, from corporate like major labels. There was no music industry, music industry interest in the district. So they uh, got together and they started a label just in their houses called Discord. And the original function of it was to put out a seven inch record by a band that they had that was breaking up called the Teen Isles. This is, this is that seven inch record. Uh, this is a replica. It actually came out on a box set, which actually was just released this week. Discord Records actually just uh, passed in 2020. They passed their 40th anniversary. So as a as a momentous occasion, they just to to commemorate the occasion, they decided that they were going to release this box set, their first six records, the first seven inch records that they released as a label in 1980 and 1981. And the first record that they ever released as a label was called Minor Disturbance by Teen Idols. It's a 45, a 45 RPM record, seven inch record, and it's eight songs on it. So you do the math. Yep, every one of these songs is about one minute long. It includes such classics as Sneakers, Get Up and Go, Deadhead, uh, Fleeting Fury, Too, Too Young to Rock. These are very incredibly fast and sloppily and unprofessionally played songs by teenagers. But the music interest wasn't taking any interest in them, so they took matters into their own hands. And with the help of Skip Groff, the recently deceased Skip, Skip Groff, the owner of the, I think, long since closed down Yesterday and Today Records in Rockville, Maryland, they, um, they used to go up there just to just to hang out and, and listen to music. And Skip said, hey, you guys can make a record, you know. So they decided to form their own label. It was called, they called it Discord. And they put out this record initially. And then after that, they put out, shortly after that, they used the money they made off of that record to put out this, which is a seven inch by the band SOA. SOA was another hardcore band that played super fast and super loud. And they featured this guy. I don't know if you recognize that. That is a 19 year old Henry Rollins. So Henry Rollins is probably a much more recognizable figure because he was on Sons of Anarchy. He's become this weird cult figure. Uh, he's uh, ostensibly heterosexual, but he's also a big gay icon. He's been writing, he wrote for LA Week, Weekly for a long time. And he left DC when he was 20 to go sing for the band Black Flag, who are incredibly important in that history of, of the development of hardcore punk, the usage of you know, fret work that was established by Black Sabbath, but sped up to blinding speeds by the band Black Flag. And Henry was Black Flag's number one fan, and he left DC and he actually went out to LA in 1981 to go be their singer. He toured with them for five years, Black Flag broke up. He became a big spoken word artist, he had his own band, and he still tours as a spoken word artist. So uh, meanwhile, Ian Mackay back in DC, who is still running Discord Records, started a new band called Minor Threat who changed the world. And I'm not exaggerating about that. Minor Threat are, they, you know, their influence at first was they were very big for their scene. They were, they were four guys from DC, um, uh, two guys from Wilson High School, uh, Ian Mackay and Jeff Nelson. Ian Mackay was the singer, Jeff Nelson is the drummer. And the other two guys were from Georgetown Prep. And uh, they came together and they formed this band called Minor Threat because they were all minors. They were between 16 and 18 years old. And they wrote uh, they, the initial the initial seven inch record they put out. By the way, the originals of these are worth anywhere from five hundred to fifteen hundred dollars a pop on Discogs. If you find someone willing to sell their original pressing of them, they're incredibly valuable because they were originally just po they were originally just printed for their friends. They didn't expect that in 40 years like this is this is this record is now or at least these recordings are 41 years old um they did not expect that this would you know 40 years be listened to by people in brazil and indonesia and japan all over the world they have like this massive massive cult following including one song that ian mckay wrote called straight edge which was a description of his beliefs uh, against drug use against alcohol against drinking alcohol against promiscuous sex there is now a global movement called straight edge every country in the world has people who observe straight edge especially in um religious communities that are ostensibly against alcohol, like in uh, out west in Utah, in the Mormon community, there's a huge straight edge movement. 
Uh, as early as 1982, there were straight edge references in punk records coming out in Brazil. So Minor Threat were uh, not immediately at first, they were a pretty big deal within the DC scene. They toured a good bit, but their records sold very well for a band you know, of their profile. But like I said, Minor Threat changed the world in multiple ways. And um, there's three more records, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna go through every single one, but I'm just very excited because this is a piece of music. This is a piece of DC music history that came out. Uh, it's also worth mentioning, and this is something I did talk about in my walking tour, which I will get to, I swear, Emily. But, um, in my, uh, but in 1985, after 1983 was when Minor Threat broke up and a bunch of these hardcore bands uh, started breaking up and forming into new bands that were playing in a much more cathartic, maybe a little bit slower, more like lyrics pulled from the pages of a diary style. And um, at the time, fanzines, the only type of publications that paid any attention to this music were just, you know, like little independently published kind of like pamphlets that were that were distributed at shows all over the East Coast and, and throughout the United States, they started describing it as something called emotional hardcore. Yes, Kunid is way ahead of me. Uh, they started describing it as emotional hardcore and it got shortened to emo core and eventually it got shortened to emo. So that's where emo comes from. Um, eventually emo came to characterize like the eyeliner, hot topic, my chemical romance type music that that blew up in the mid 2000s. But emo has its origins in Washington DC in the mid 1980s. So bearing all this in mind, Washington DC has an amazing, I would, I would say, and again, this is a controversial statement, but I think more than any other American city, Washington DC has a greater influence, like a more meteoric, not meteoric, seismic influence, there we go, it's more, more of a slow burn influence on Western popular culture than any other American city. Um, you know, obviously people might think, well, what about New York? What about Los Angeles? Well, that was just where the industry was. A lot of people moved to New York and moved to Los Angeles, uh, moved to New York, moved to Los Angeles to, uh, sorry, I got a reminder that just popped up. Um, okay, someone said, uh, someone said New Orleans, which is a good, very good point. Okay, let me rewind. Uh, Washington DC has probably the best influence on the development of of, of the post-punk subculture in the United States. Uh, you know, it can't, you know, it's, it's, it really gets into major apples and oranges territory when you look at, you know, New Orleans, the history of like uptown versus the, like the history of like the black uptown musical influences. And of course, Louis Arm, Buddy Bolden and Louis Armstrong versus the Creole downtown, like classic French opera influence and how of course that permeated throughout, you know, all of Western music, but, um, so that being said, I will, I will correct myself and say that, I will I'll correct myself and say that at least within the post-punk era, DC has a disproportionate seismic influence because of what, you know, it wasn't just this group of kids from Northwest DC, which included Ian MacKay and uh, Jeff Nelson, and who randomly enough, Jeff Nelson now lives in Toledo, Ohio, and he, owned, he, he bought a mansion in Toledo, Ohio, and he has the world's largest collection of bubble gum. Very interesting dude. So uh, getting back to this, so it, the walking tour that I did uh, started at the conference hotel, which ran from, which was in Adams Moore, well, in Woodley Park, actually. The conference hotel was in Woodley Park. And the group, which sold out immediately, I was shocked because I didn't know if anyone would want to do this. I just posted the walking tour as an option for AAG. And yes, the Marriott in Woodley Park. Oh, the hotel closed. So it's like a giant, like, empty Soviet style silo right now. <laughs> what's, what's the, yes. go ahead. Yeah, yes, it's like it becoming empty. apartments or something like that. They're turning that giant thing into, I mean, yeah. I guess there's enough demand. I mean, I mean, what, where, what else can DC do to, to overinflate its housing bubble? Uh, turning into condos, of course, of course. Why did I even have a second? Why did I even have to ask? So, Anyway, we started at the, the Marriott and Woodley Park and we moved down across the Ellington Bridge where I stopped and I talked a little bit about Duke Ellington because I think when I ask my students, I teach at Central Michigan University and I often ask my students, I'll show them a picture of Duke Ellington and I ask them, who is this? And very rarely does anyone know who that is. And I think that that's a failing of American you know, music education, but also education in the humanities because uh, yeah, yeah, what's the, uh, I'm waiting for you to say fire up chips, Paul. 
that's what it, you know whenever i whenever i have any like my cmu mask or my cmu shirt on and i'm somewhere random in the united states someone will just say fire up chips anyway the 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 tour started actually on the ellington bridge which was a convergence of both the dc punk history because uh people who lived in the glover park area close to um uh, rock creek park rock creek park sort of turned into this giant bowl that that echoed sound so um punk percussion protests that a number of the punks went to at the South African embassy in 1987, 1988, were reverberated throughout Rock Creek Park. And there were a number of DC punks who were part of that early hardcore scene that lived near Rock Creek Park so they could, they could hear the reverberations. And also standing on the bridge, I said, well, Ellington's name is on a bridge and it's on the high school and probably a couple other things, but it's, you know, the way, from, from where I sit, I feel like Ellington needs to be talked about in the way we talk about other major like figures in western popular culture just because he was in a lot of ways responsible for for in in the eyes of i guess mainstream america if you want to call it legitimizing jazz like turning jazz into what was considered like a, a, a art form by a wider mainstream audience in the 1920s and 1930s he also was very good at writing when when shellac records became the standard for releasing jazz music. He was very good at writing these short, punchy jazz songs, which was very similar to what the DC hardcore kids would do in the early 80s. They would write these very short, punchy songs that could fit on seven inch records because they didn't have a whole lot of space on them. And then I further, oh, thank you very much for, for the sharing that, Tom. Yeah, Duke Ellington is, I think, you know, I, I, I still have a lot to learn about him, but his life and, you know, he, his life actually very much mirrored, speaking of New Orleans, uh, Louis Armstrong, because they were both born around 1900, and they were both, um, they were, they both were, were very much like a product of New Orleans and DC, respectively, but the Duke actually moved to New York, and, uh, and Satchmo moved to Chicago to have careers making music. And that was something that a lot of people from DC had to do. Al Jolson came from G from DC, the, the probably arguably the biggest star in the history of vaudeville, one of the biggest, most famous Jewish entertainers of, of all time, uh, Al Jolson. Uh, Marvin Gaye came from DC. He was another uh, he was another DC native that that left DC in order to make a name for himself. And um, no, Sean, <laughs> the lions roaring at the National Zoo. I actually I, I never realized that. That's really funny. So, um, but anyway, the, you know, I, I'll, I'll, end sh I'll end here shortly, but the walking tour itself, I have, I wrote a chapter about it that's about to come out in a book that's being published by a couple of my colleagues at Monash University in Melbourne, where I go through each of the stops on the tour and talk about how over the course of the walking tour, it occurred to me that I wasn't just telling the story about a bunch, you know, a bunch of punk bands that played in Adams Morgan back in the early 80s. I was talking about this greater story about the convergence of, for example, the importance of immigrant cultures in Washington, DC. One of the things that I kept on noticing when I talked about these extinct venues, which are now like high-end cupcake shops and whatnot in, in Adams Morgan, was this continuity that I noticed when I was telling about like, oh, well, I remember I, I read about a bunch of these, these bands used to play at this this venue that was rented to them by Ethiopian immigrants who started this restaurant and they were just trying to make money after hours so they let these kids set up their amps and play shows. I realized that a lot of venues that not just in the early 80s era that a lot of people tend to focus on when they talk about early DC hardcore, they there were a lot of um, for you know there were a lot of different uh, immigrant immigrants own immigrant owned restaurants that became venues that you know, because a lot of bands that played this style over the years didn't have access to, you know, at first it was hard to, it was hard for younger bands to get into the 930 club when it was at, when it was down on F street in its original location. Uh, then Black Cat didn't open until 1993. So it, so there was this dearth of places for bands to play, especially if they were teenagers. So one of the places that, that a lot of kids would play would be um, like, I think one place called the Africa club, I could be I could be misnaming it, but it is now a very, uh, it, it's now kind of like a fancy, very urbane gym on the corner of Florida Avenue and 18th Street at that intersection between U and 18th and Florida Avenue. 
Dalok, which was an Eritrean restaurant, is actually a place that I emceed a couple of band shows, uh, very similar, an Eritrean restaurant in the, in the mid to late 2000s became a watering hole for local musicians and poets because they were one of the venues that, you know, unlike other, you know, higher end places, and I'll use that term, I'll use that term lightly, I'll use that term with a grain of salt, but um, much more, much more expensive or much more, you know, places that, that are indicative of gentrification would be a lot more, would be a lot less eager to let, you know, a bunch of artists come in and set up a PA system and have an open mic. But Dalak, in, even in the late 2000s, and this is something that still happens throughout DC, became a really important gathering place for artists. So that was something that really brought a lot of people on the tour together because there were a whole bunch of people that weren't really punk fans. And that's why I asked how many people know who Ian Mackay is, because you don't have to know who he is to appreciate that landscape or appreciate how important you know, that movement was to DC, to DC and to the the greater like urban landscape around the world, but also, um, but also just, you know, realizing that you don't have to be this, you know, this insider with all this knowledge about very specific niche music histories to see how important that was to building community and still is. And uh, that's one thing that I loved about DC when I lived there was just the accessibility of a lot of these people. Um, a lot of the type of people that I grew up listening to, you'd bump into on the street on 18th street all the time. Uh, like, uh, what's the, I can't remember the name of the, the very trendy cafe in, um, next to Madame's organ. I can't remember. Uh, Trist. Trist. Thank you. Thank you, Trist. Yeah. I remember, like, I'd walk by Trist and I would see, I remember seeing my friend Sadat who played drums in a bunch of bands. He would always be hanging out there with his laptop. And uh, randomly, Matthew Lesko, do you remember that guy? He was the guy with like the free money from the government, like books that he would he would sell, like with the question marks on his suit. I remember going in there one night and he was sitting by the fire, just very demurely typing on his laptop, wearing his suit with all the question marks on it. <laughs> Completely just, it, it, he just acted like anyone else in there, except he's wearing his question mark suit. But um whether that's connected, whether that's connected to the punk, to like DC punk history, that's very, very specious. But um, I just felt like sharing that random memory. So, um, so what I'm, what I'll do is I, I haven't, I, I, I have a list of the locations for anyone who's interested. Please, I'll put my email address in the in the chat, and I think it should also be available via your your coordinators, but. Um, I'm trying to gather at least like a list of the locations and talk about which buildings were incredibly important to DC punk history. One of which is 2318 18th Street Northwest on um, right in the main strip in Adams Morgan there where Adams Organ, which was a, uh, a Corker and art students collective back in, um, back in the late seventies. It was just this very sort of socialist kind of ideal collective that they got together and the Yippies took control of it and they booked shows there, which is why bands like Teen Idols were able to play there with other bands like Bad Brains and other touring groups because they couldn't find, like touring punk bands couldn't find places to play in DC. So they would play at Madam's Organ. And for a while it was the home to Crooked Beat Records, which has been gentrified out of Adams Morgan and now is in Alexandria, not far from Old Town. But um, I think right now that downstairs in that house is a di is like a grow space for people who want to grow their own weed and hydroponics so continuing the diy tradition i guess the do-it-yourself punk tradition but um but yeah that's that was you know the experience of running that walking tour was fantastic and i like i said you know most of the people who were on that tour just wanted to see the real dc they thought that it would be a good opportunity to see washington dc outside the veneer of the monuments and the veneer of you know this kind of like national, like uh, nationalist iconography of the United States, because they feel like, you know, anyone can go to the Smithsonian's, anyone can go see the Washington Monument and the White House. But I think that when they saw DC Punk, they thought, oh, that's something different. And it's, uh, it's like a, a layer of, you know, a layer of the landscape that is incredibly important. And if that's the reason, that's one of the things that motivated me to move there when I was, when I was 22. And it's one of the things that keeps me that, that, that makes me miss DC. So um, 
So Sean says previously lived at 2300. So also former residents of President Lincoln's and Bomber. That's what they mean when they say palimpsest landscapes. The layers of the landscape are just so, there's so many layers of like history buried there. So uh, so right next door to Lincoln's and Bomber is one of the places that was an early incubator of, of uh, early incubator of punk culture and art in the district. And uh, just to just to really quickly check the chat so make sure I didn't miss anything. Uh, Puneet, you and I have to talk. Uh, he, he gave a shout out to Nation of Ulysses. Uh, they also hail from DC. Uh, yes, Nation of Ulysses put out two LPs on Discord and um, he and uh, Ian Spinonius, who has, he came, I think he came into some controversy recently because of uh, some, some, there were some questions about like some of his behavior, but he he was very apologetic, and I think he cleaned I think he cleaned the slate in the punk community about that. He was in a band called The Makeup in the late '90s, and then he had a band called Chain in the Gang. So he's still pretty actively touring, and he put out a book of essays called Censorship Now, which is pretty which is a lot of fun. I have it somewhere on my bookcase. But yeah, Nation of Ulysses were a fascinating like. Kind of, I don't even know, Puni. You could probably you could probably talk about what made Nation of Ulysses unique and 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 fascinating. It wasn't just music; it was also their like uh, approach to like approach to art and how they how they went about. It. And they were all like twenty twenty one, and they had this like they had this like very active like community that they built in this this house. I think somewhere in Mount Pleasant. That was what I heard. So uh, so yeah. Um, I'm happy to I'm happy to uh, you know answer any further questions. I don't want to take too much time from Allison, so uh, just let me know what you would like to do. Cool, thanks, Tyler. Yeah, I think it's cool. You're right to like learn about um, the history of DC that's not related to like government and politics and like that kind of stuff. You know, to understand like the other side of the people that have made DC what it is and also just made this, you know, clearly this country what it is, right? So Oh yeah. And that's what that's that's what, you know, one of the reasons why the uh you know Ian and Jeff, Ian Mackay and Jeff Nelson started Discord was because they were tired of, you know, but they were they were at this they were at this age where they realized that, you know, to much of the tourist crowd and whatnot and the international view of DC, like they didn't exist. You know, it's like people who people who come from Las Vegas or people who come from, you know, much of the, much, much of like, like middle and lower class, like who, who come from cities that are mostly experienced by tourists is that they're, they're kind of made to feel invisible. And, uh, you know, I certainly had no interest in being part of the federal government when I moved to DC and a lot, a lot of my friends didn't either. Inevitably, I think it's, it's inevitable that someone might get sucked into that maybe working for a contractor or whatnot, but, um, but I think that that's what, that's what's so, in, in, a, in a way it's really relatable for people or people in cities around the world who, that are, that are kind of like that, that are so heavily leveraged on, on tourism or federal capitals, like, you know, Paris, that's why I wrote my dissertation about DC and Paris, because those cities both kind of share that weird liminal existence as, as um, places that are so romanticized and have so many different weird iconographies that don't necessarily reflect local or um, you know authentic culture. Well, um, what do you think, Tom? We have room, time for uh, Carney. Someone one question. <laughs> someone, uh, yeah, Craig shared a, a Carney's um, uh, visual visualization project about Discord. Uh, Fugazi, yeah, Fugazi. I I didn't mention Fugazi once. Uh, they're probably the most that Fugazi and Bad Brains are probably the most like I don't know canonized band out of DC, and they they toured pretty consistently and worldwide for like fifteen years. Um, but yeah, Carney Clears was uh, he would we we had a lot of friends in common. We we knew each other, but we were more like we we're more associates. In my time there but yes thank you for sharing that well i have to say that um admittedly i'm a bit ignorant 
at least before tonight, I was a bit ignorant of the DC punk scene. Um, but I, I just had no idea of the death. And this is, uh, this is somebody who's lived in DC his whole life. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, it, it's, it's a great, it's a great story and it's a great walking tour. Um, and I look forward to uh, reading that chapter when it comes out. Yeah, I'll try to I'll try to make it available for everyone. I don't know how much the book is going to cost, so and uh, yeah. academic publishing being what it is, but yeah, my friend Paul, who's you know he he worked for Media Matters for a long time. He's a DC native. He grew up in uh, he he you know he grew up in Arlington and he's lived there as pretty much his whole life. And he's not a big punk fan, but I remember chatting with him about it one time when he found out what I was doing for my PhD, and he told me that even though he wasn't really necessarily into the music or into the scene, he thought it was great because it was hit. He felt like it was his, you know, he and his friends were aware of it. were like, that's, and as DC kids in the, in the nineties, they were just sort of like, it's something that is very much a hundred percent authentically DC and, you know, where everything else you feel like comes from New York or LA and pop culture, but, but, you know, bands like Fugazi and Jawbox that it just felt like something that was home to them, even if it wasn't, even if they weren't going to shows, but they just knew that it existed and it was theirs. Well, Tyler Sonicson, thank you very much for uh, giving us a history and geography of punk music in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much so, for having really me. Really fascinating.